Hello and welcome to Pediatric Trauma Series. This is Part 1, Introduction to Trauma and the Approaching Assessment. My name is Dusty Lynn and I'm the Pediatric Educator here at the Life Support Learning Center. In this series, we will talk about the introduction to trauma. We'll then talk about the primary pediatric trauma assessment, the secondary pediatric trauma assessment, We'll have a special presentation on pediatric TBI as well as pediatric non-accidental trauma. I hope you will join us for all the presentations. Our objectives today are to recognize the burden of the trauma in pediatric populations. We'll describe the initial pediatric assessment process, which includes the approaching assessment, and we'll recognize the main goal of trauma care in the pediatric patient we would be remiss to talk about pediatric trauma without talking about injury prevention. Whether it's the use of helmets on bicycles or burn prevention or fall risk assessments and prevention, the wearing of seat belts, all of these things are part of injury prevention and should be part of every healthcare provider's daily life in our profession. Whether we're seeing a pediatric patient in the clinic or we're seeing them in the ER for other reasons, or we have a pediatric patient on the wards or in the ICUs, we should always be discussing, assessing and discussing with parents injury prevention so that even though that might not be why they're here now, we will hopefully prevent morbidity and mortality in the future by discussing injury prevention. So some of the general concepts in pediatric trauma care is that you are assessing them for major exsanguination as soon as you see that patient and start to approach him. But really, rapid airway assessment is occurring simultaneously as well as the intervention for maintaining a patent airway. Should our patient decline at any given time during the trauma process, we should immediately go back to assessing the ABCs. Our main goal of trauma care really is to prevent secondary injury by rapid assessment and intervention of life-threatening injuries. Again, injury prevention is the only thing that's gonna change and hopefully prevent the primary injury. There's not a lot we can do about that otherwise, but it's the body's response to that primary injury, which we can have a direct input in this patient's outcome by avoiding secondary injury. Some of the common causes of pediatric injury are age-based and sex-based of, of our patients. The highest injury and mortality rates occur in males who are under 18 years old. Here are some of the common causes for injuries, whether it's car crashes or bikes or the combination thereof. Suffocation, drowning, poisoning, burns, and falls, especially in the infants and toddlers. And violence, unfortunately, is another reason for trauma in the pediatric population whether it's a toddler who doesn't know any better or an adolescent who has high risk-taking behaviors, all of these things contribute to injury in the pediatric patient. On this slide, you can see that there's common patterns of injury based on the mechanism of injury. And the important thing to recognize is again, with interventions of injury prevention, like seat belts and helmets, that can make a difference in their outcome and initial injury. So it's important to assess for these things in our patients. Death from trauma, half the kids who die will do so on scene. Another peak happens in that first hour, and that third peak happens at about six hours post-trauma. So those first 30 minutes of care really, really matter. Blunt trauma is the most prevalent mechanism, and if this is an isolated injury, the CNS injury is the most common that you'll see in the pediatric patient, even though we know that multi-trauma is how most patients present. If it is an isolated injury, it's head injury that is the main injured system. Head traumas are the leading cause of death in the pediatric patient. We recognize that children are not just small adults. Even though we're talking about trauma processes as being the same, the ATLS process in the pediatric patient or the adult patient, we have to recognize that a child's response to trauma is very different than the adult. The mechanisms 
by which kids get injured are different. Their patterns of injury based on their anatomy can be very different. And one of the key things to remember is a pediatric patient's response to shock, very different than adults. Kids can be in fulminant shock despite a normal blood pressure. So if you are looking at only numbers as to assessing whether or not this child is in shock, you can miss severe shock in the pediatric patient as their blood pressure may not change until right before death. So general principles of care, we must be prepared, whether it's through practicing scenarios, simulation, reviewing that practice in those simulations. We have a very robust simulation team here at the Life Support Learning Center, and they travel throughout the facility doing simulations. And so please be a part of those if you can be. Very, very helpful. You must know your equipment, what you have available to you. Make sure it's in working order. We've all probably been in a situation where we went to grab for a suction and it wasn't working because the lid wasn't snapped on well. That can happen. Understanding our stat processes like difficult airway and how to get blood, how to give blood emergently in the pediatric patient is very important. Because kids can vary their vital signs, their weight, and their needs for equipment based on their size, it's very important to have a reference. What are the normal vital signs for an infant as compared to a 10-year-old? How do we estimate weight? That's one of the things that's most difficult to estimate without a proper reference is weight in the pediatric patient. And we know medication is almost always based on their weight, so it's important we get it pretty correct, right? We also need to recognize that because we give medications based on weight, there's a certain cutoff that we need to have and recognize that you don't just keep calculating. If this is a teenager or adolescent patient who is rather large and over 50 kilos, we need to consider whether or not we need to still calculate medications based on weight because we could give them a toxic adult dose based on their weight if we don't recognize that there is a, a margin there that you um, need to stay within. And of course, another great principle of trauma care is that retrospective review. Taking your case reviews and looking at them, having discussions about them, video reviews. If you are fortunate enough to work in a facility that videos your traumas and your resuscitations, be a part of that video review. Very, very helpful in trauma care and improving processes. So what is the goal of the initial pediatric trauma care? It really is to prevent secondary injury by rapidly identifying and managing life threats throughout the process. So again, unless it is injury prevention, we can't do a whole lot about that initial injury, but it's the body's response to trauma that we can have a direct input in preventing secondary injury and improve outcomes in our patients whether it's the protecting of the C-spine despite the fact that they need airway manipulation, recognizing that a head tilt chin lift is not appropriate for a pediatric patient who might have a head or neck injury, doing that thorough primary exam to look for and treat life-threatening conditions, understanding that patients in shock, we must stop that shock cascade. So we have to recognize shock in the first place and then stop that shock cascade to prevent secondary injury. And certainly in our patients who have head traumas, recognizing situations that might increase the ICP and avoiding those things and intervening rapidly when they do occur, very important to prevent secondary injury. So why is it that sometimes we miss important assessment information? We recognize that pediatric trauma can be very stressful. If we don't have a systematic approach to help keep us on our game in situations where you have family members that might be screaming and asking us to please save their child. It's easy to get off our game. We might have equipment that we rarely use and skills that if we haven't practiced, we may not be up on to really intervene when we need. So again, that systematic approach is so important to have ingrained in our brain to stay on track in these stressful situations. We have to recognize that the pediatric patient could have very subtle responses initially to severe injury, and we could miss the fact that they have severe injury. 
So what are the phases of trauma resuscitation? That preparation, that pre-prep before the patient ever arrives, knowing our equipment, knowing our environment, and really practicing those skills and behaviors that are going to help keep us focused in this stressful event. There's that prep that we do immediately um, when we hear the patient's in route, and of course the triage that occurs when the patient presents. We'll have that approaching assessment, whether or not there is exsanguination that we need to take care of, and then the ABC process, the primary survey, and the secondary survey are reassessments and adjuncts. And even though we follow the ATLS process for assessment and intervention, the reality is there are many things that are done simultaneously, so we must make sure that we keep our priorities in order. Airway, breathing, circulation. So that trauma survey approach, again, CABC will reevaluate ongoing simultaneous reassessments, recognizing that if this patient has a sudden demise or if there's a sudden change in his stability, we need to go right back to the ABCs and the initial process and reassess. Once we've taken care of the life-threatening injuries, then we'll move on to the secondary survey. That's where we do a log roll and we assess the patient's back. We'll do a complete history and then a detailed head-to-toe exam, recognizing that sometimes that detailed head-to-toe exam may occur in the ICU. So if you're admitting a trauma patient, it is very important to do a head-to-toe detailed exam. You might pick up on some injuries that at the time were not life-threatening, certain broken bones, etc., that weren't part of the life-saving mission that occurred in the initial response. But now that the patient is stabilized, we have time to do that detailed assessment. Very important to do. And why is this order so important, that ABC? Because again, kids can lose their airway and have precious few minutes before they succumb to brain damage or death. So keeping things in order, ABC, very important. You're assessing in the right order, and you're going to intervene in the right order. And we'll fix the life-threatening issues before we move on to secondary surveys. So just what is this approaching assessment? It's something we all do, we just need to articulate it. It's what we see in here as we're approaching the patient that gives us some indication of how sick this baby or this child is. So is there obvious exsanguination? Clearly, if you're approaching this patient and you can see blood spurting, someone needs to take care of that right away as you continue to assess their affect, their general appearance. Are they looking right through you? Are they crying appropriately? Pediatric patients, based on their developmental phase, will respond differently to trauma. So it's important to understand and and recognize when a child is not acting normal. Also, as part of the A approaching assessment, do you hear noise and airway noise? That might be an indication that their airway is obstructed or soon to be. Are they breathing? Whether or not you can see chest rise depends on how exposed the patient is as you initially approach them. And what is their circulation as evidenced by their color and their cerebral perfusion, again, and how they're reacting to their environment? All these things are what we're doing as we're approaching the patient. We're not standing in the doorway, pausing. We're approaching this patient. But these are the things that we are assessing as we're approaching them. Certainly, if we see obvious exsanguination, we must be prepared for it. We have our full PPE on in the trauma patient. If you see exsanguination, we're going to stop the bleed. Do we know where our tourniquets and quick clot are? Do we know how to access blood products quickly? Should we need them? And though it rarely occurs, do we know what's needed to open a chest in a pediatric patient in a life-threatening situation? So again, introduction to trauma and the approaching assessment. Our summary is that trauma is the leading cause of death in children in the United States. Injury prevention is certainly the key to decreasing mortality and morbidity. And once we have a pediatric trauma patient, we must be prepared. Knowing our resources and our equipment through simulation and review, we're ready with our skills. 
We need to decide as we're approaching that patient, is there a life-threatening exsanguination? If so, we need to stop the bleed while we're simultaneously approaching him to assess his airway. We should have a well-practiced systematic approach because we know that improves outcomes. Assessment and management of the primary survey should occur simultaneously. Again, we're assessing in the right order. We're going to treat in the right order. Thank you so much for joining us for this introduction to pediatric trauma. I hope you will join us for the upcoming primary assessment and other in the series of pediatric trauma.